Well, thank you for inviting me to talk to you today about what Bell is doing in urban air mobility, which we believe will have a significant and impactful change on our society and the world. So from the first American fighter jet, to breaking the sound barrier, to the jet pack, to the lunar landing research vehicle, certifying the first commercial helicopter, and the tilt rotor, innovation has always been part of Bell's DNA. I'm sure many of you have noticed, at least I have hope you noticed by now, we have dropped helicopter from our name. If not, we have our dragonfly staring at you throughout this uh, presentation this morning. The word helicopter at the end of our name was too confining. We just don't make helicopters and we never have. Bell has always been a technology driven company creating amazing vertical lift experiences, vertical lift experiences, and we're continuing that same spirit with urban air mobility. So when did urban air mobility become a challenge? We must go back to the 1900s. If you look over here at 1900 on the left hand side there, all horse and buggies and one car. Three years later, 1903, it's all cars and one horse and buggy. It's an amazing change in just three years, isn't it? Henry Ford made the automobile accessible for the masses and it changed how we all got around. About that same time, the Wright brothers took their first flight at Kitty Hawk. And I'm sure a lot of folks were wondering what was next, flying cars? Well, by 1924, popular science was predicting airborne autos were only 20 years away. So here we are today, once again, at the convergence of change. Cities are seeing a revitalization of our urban areas. However, it's difficult to get around. As you mentioned earlier, if you think about Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, any mega city around the world, this is what it looks like. And most of the time, they're not moving that quickly. Usually you're setting. We lose hundreds of hours of our precious time and productivity sitting in traffic. So what have we done? As you can see there, you continue to expand. You make the lanes wider, grow wider, you stack the highways, we put railway systems in, we go underground with subways, but the fact is we're running out of physical space. Also, construction is extremely disruptive and it takes a long time. In Fort Worth, I have been driving down I-35W for years, and I honestly can't remember when it wasn't under construction, or it should be due to the congestion. So we're looking to the skies. And the timing couldn't be better. We're seeing tremendous technology advances in processing power, communications bandwidths and speeds, sensors, flight controls, autonomy, artificial intelligence, electrical energy storage, and electric motors. Our challenge is determining where to draw the line on the maturity of these technologies and then move forward, integrating them to provide a safe and efficient mobility service. But I think just as important is laying the foundation for each of these technologies to continue advancing and then be incorporated when they're ready without a major overall impact of that system, spiral upgrades, if you will. So as, as the processing power changes, the comm changes, the battery systems change, you want to be able to incorporate those immediately into the system without a major overhaul to the system. This technology also goes well beyond, beyond the vehicle itself. The digital infrastructure that will move people and things. From booking the flight, to air traffic management, to the onboard experience, to tracking the health of the vehicle, to maintenance, the digital infrastructure is critical to UAM success. And although manned initially, we need to design this ecosystem now for it to be unmanned. And since tech is such a key enabler to this, we must have multi-layered cybersecurity for protection. So what we dreamt about 100 years ago is now reality. It's no longer a matter of if, it's when it's going to happen. However, to make this vision reality, we can't just produce the VTOL aircraft. We also need to define how and where they're going to operate and how they will work seamlessly within our cities. We understand this is a big undertaking, but bringing complex systems to the market is what we do. But it can't just be us either. It will require collaboration across industry, regulatory agencies, other interested parties, and the communities where they will operate. If we're gonna go from point A to point B in this new world, we need to navigate this complex ecosystem. 
In a few moments, I'll walk you through the elements, including regulatory, which includes type certification, operation, the infrastructure, and manufacturing at scale, which will be key to meet the demand of the, the, the demand that they're having for this, as well as the affordability goals for UAM. But let's first talk about how Bell got here. So two years ago, we unveiled our air taxi cabin at CAS. And we designed the cabin first because we wanted it to center on passenger safety and comfort. We also wanted your, fl your flight to be a fun, interactive experience. So our feeling was, as if we started with the flight technology first and worked inward, we would sub-optimize the customer experience. And I'm an engineer and a lot of engineers are out there. If you start looking at requirements, we try and create these amazing flying vehicles and by the time we worked our way back to the cabin, it's pretty darn small because it's the most efficient, less drag. So that's why we said, no, we're not gonna do it that way. We're gonna baseline the cabin because we want the priority to be the passengers and then work our way outward for the flight. So that aircraft seated four, including a pilot with ample storage for bags. And why a pilot? We want people to feel safe and get comfortable with the aircraft. Most commercial flights today are performed using automation, but pilots are still on board. The tech is developed and maturing, but as humans, we're not ready for flying without pilots. We will get there, but rest assured, safety will continue to be at the forefront as we progress towards fully autonomous. And I truly believe logistics will pave the way here. I think that's where we'll start with this. Let's move logistics and packages first autonomous and then build the confidence and work our way back into to people flying. So this year, we unveiled the Bell Nexus. And again, the cornerstone of that design was safety. From the first time we walked down the aisle and saw it, to walking around it, climbing in it, we wanted safety to be the furthest thing from your mind. We designed this because I wanted my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter, to feel comfortable flying in it by herself. We also wanted it to wow you, generate excitement, feelings of anticipation to explore it. We wanted to show you the future is within our grasp and that it is really cool. Most of my folks know that that's probably the biggest thing as, as we get into these designs. And I can tell you it wasn't an easy task. We had lots of healthy debate. Uh, I know some of the, the creative people in the room here and, and some of the engineers uh, have told me that I think this was des uh, design iteration number 36. Uh, I thought it was a fantastic experience. I don't know how they felt about it, but, but uh, number 36 looks pretty darn good. So based on this response so far, we feel good about the design. Nexus is a ducted fan hybrid electric aircraft, fully autonomous, capable, flight capable. It will convert from helicopter to airplane mode, just like our tilt rotors. One change we did make from our air taxi cabin experience to the Nexus was we added a fifth seat. We wanted the fifth seat to be the pilot so we'd still have four passenger carriage in the vehicle. It is roughly a 6,000 pound aircraft, a speed of 150 miles an hour, range of 150 miles. It will be quiet to operate in the urban environment. As you also noticed, we announced at CS we have some outstanding partners are now developing this demo aircraft for us headed towards first flight. We will also continue to pursue a parallel path of all electric because we truly believe that is the right answer. However, the batteries to support an aircraft of that size and speed and range of requirements that we're after just aren't there yet. But as I talked earlier, when it is ready, we can easily remove our engine and the fuel tank and install the additional batteries, essentially a spiral upgrade, and we didn't have impact anything else about the flying vehicle. Now, as far as the flight control system goes, we will use predetermined flight paths to move from vertiport to vertiport. It will also engage other systems to manage traffic flow and ensure safe, secure and efficient flight. But we can't have operations of an aircraft without a regulatory environment that supports it. Our approach is to work with regulators now to establish a safe and holistic approach that doesn't overburden any one aspect of the system. We are also addressing both vehicle type cert and how we'll operate in the airspace. It is encouraging to us right now, we are continuing to work with FAA, EASA, Transport Canada, as well as other regulatory agencies and other OEMs. So we're already having that engagement now. And to help to pave the way for new concepts, 
the Department of Transportation recently announced the creation of the Non-Traditional and Emerging Transportation Council. This will help industry resolve jurisdictional and regulatory gaps that could impede these new technologies, especially those that cover multimodal applications. So right now, certification for this type of aircraft doesn't exist, especially like one we just showed you. It converts. It's an airplane and it converts in, it's a helicopter and converts into an airplane and back, right? So we have part 23 for small airplanes and we have part 27 for rotorcraft. Uh, we're something we're in between. However, saying that, as the as same as our tilt rotors, they spend almost all their time as airplanes. The only time they're really the helicopter is that initial transition phase on takeoff and in landing, the rest of the time they're an airplane. We will also have normal aviation requirements for vehicle identification, communication, and separation of other aircraft, and what is needed for airworthiness, such as standard practices for maintenance and inspections. And the safety part is the most important. It is paramount. It is the biggest key to acceptance. After all, people will not use this if they don't feel safe. So now let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure. So infrastructure on the ground. It has always been key to this opportunity and will, it has been in our past. Highways, bridges, ports, waterways, airports have long stood as monuments to furthering progress. So we will need those physical infrastructures as well. Vertiports, in which the VTOL aircraft will take off and land. And what we need to do right now when we're planning it, we need to put the vertiports where it relieves the congestion and not makes it worse. And we've had lots of conversations with communities on that as well, that when you set up hub and spoke systems, you can move mass transmit right into another congestion point. So how are we going to put the vertiports in there where it will relieve the congestion as opposed to add to it? These vertiports, when you think about it, will need to safely manage and support the interaction of vehicles, passengers, baggage, all at a high rate of operation. So today we can stand in an airport terminal and look out and see it all happening out on the ramp in the tarmac out there. But think about what we're doing in the vertiports, whether we're laying them out like an airport and flat or they're vertically stacked. You're going to have people coming into the, into the vertiport to take off, people coming out of the vertiport, baggage moving in and out, vehicles being charged while they're in the vertiports. All that operation is going on. And how do we make sure that we design the vertiports so all that can produce a high rate, but yet make... The most important thing is everybody's safe operating around it. We also need to secure passenger info and access. Another critical component is managing the acoustic signature of the aircraft. Like a good neighbor, these aircraft need to be quiet and blend into the noise of the city. And the reason that I bring that up here is we do focus on the signature, uh, acoustic signature of the aircraft itself in the design. But when you think about the vertiports and how we're going to move these uh, aircraft through the cities, there are going to be some super quiet neighborhoods, and no matter how quiet we make this vehicle, they're going to hear it. So if we lay out the pathways in the sky of where they're going, we need them to blend into the noise of the city that's already there. That way, nobody will really uh, be aware of their movement. Next, let's talk about manufacturing. So for on-demand mobility to succeed, affordability goals must be met. And our manufacturing framework focuses on cost, weight of the aircraft, and the environmental impact. We are developing many advanced manufacturing technologies. And for example, one of them that we're using is we do a lot of rapid prototyping uh, to get things out quickly and efficiently. And so how do we take what we do in rapid prototyping and enlarge that to more full-scale type production? We're also designing our factories right now using augmented and virtual reality. Again, we've got to lay them out and actually see how they function in that environment, make sure we get it right before we actually start any brick and mortar. We also employ 3D printing for rapid design iteration and efficient production for some of our parts. So these techniques and many others allow us to be faster and more agile, bringing down costs and giving flexibility to our design. Another thing when you think about it, the forecasted demand for these vehicles, it's not quite automobile rates, but it is much greater than what we experience in aerospace today. So consequently, that high rate production must be considered now in the design of the vehicles as well as the design of the factories and the supply chain that supports it. So Bell is working towards a goal of viable urban air mobility operation by 2025. However, we can also envision many other applications of this beyond ride sharing. Uh, today there's commercial missions including emergency medical, tourism, 
corporate use, and of course logistics. As I mentioned earlier, I think logistics is one of the areas that, again, for sure, fully autonomous will work. But in addition to our Nexus aircraft, which we believe will move people and packages, uh, we did have in our video the uh, automated pod transport, which we designed and dedicated for logistics movements. It's a family of systems. It's a tail sitter that converts into a, a biplane for efficient flight. It can carry 20 pack pound packages, and we have a, a vehicle that will go up to 1,000 pounds, all electric to hybrid electric. We also believe there's going to be military applications for this, where a safe, efficient, and affordable and quiet aircraft could play a critical role. In fact, the military most likely could be the early adopters of this technology. So now comes the hard part of innovation. Getting resources mobilized and really adopting new ways of doing things to bring solutions to market. So we're going to continue to work aggressively with our industry partners, as well as the regulators, to address challenges and develop solutions that will shape the appropriate regulation. Thank you.